Welcome to another episode of the Plants and People podcast. This is Robin Harford from eatweeds.co.uk and I'm here with Pete Yo, who is the man behind Future Flora. And I first met Pete last year, so a year ago, uh, because I, I heard that he was doing a talk in North Devon on invasive species and an alternative model to them. Are they a friend or are they a foe or are they somewhere in between? So recently there was an article in the Telegraph, you know, really going on about we need to start balsam bashing and getting rid of this bloody immigrant. Um, and so I thought, well, Pete, he's the man to talk to. Um, his talks are really, really inspiring and, and good. And he's got the science and he's just got some some interesting takes on the whole invasive species discussion. It's not cut and dry. Um, for years, I've always been promoting that actually invasive species are here to teach us something, that if we can learn nature's ways, being a very young species ourselves, uh, maybe we can learn a thing or two. So, Pete, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Robin, and hello, everyone. So just give a little bit of background. You're a plantsman, and how did you? how did invasives come into your kind of um, thinking and why why invasives what what grabs them about you for you <clears throat> well I won't give you the whole story but um, the last three or four years I've been uh, really kind of indulging my interest in and passion for plants and the relationships between plants and it was some years ago now before that that I kind of realized that as I was getting to know plants better from a kind of horticultural garden point of view, um, it was quite clear that some of the plants that we grow in our gardens are actively naturalizing um, across our British landscape. And um, I was kind of really struck by, you know, how that might play out. And with environmental kind of sensibilities as well, I was obviously aware of climate change and, and the potential impacts on our flora uh, of that. and. Yeah, just started to kind of speculate about how it how things might pan out uh, and you know generally kind of look at immigrant plants uh, and there's a there's a whole another conversation we could have about how we project onto immigrant plants as we do with people sure. but when you look in look at immigrant plants the kind of standout group are the invasive plants and the more i kind of looked at them the more I, I don't know, kind of stumbled upon references to uh, an alternative way of looking at invasive plants and that they weren't always bad. Uh, and in fact, even when they were held to be bad, that the, the evidence for that didn't really stack up. And certain books, uh, as is often the way, came, came in front of me and I kind of hungrily uh, read them and started to kind of have yeah, a very different uh, perception of, of invasive plants and perhaps invasive species more generally and and it's that that I've been starting to to look at more closely the last few years and yeah have quite a different um, <laughs> quite a different perspective than than many people and particularly classic conservationists for example um, yeah yeah okay so the 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 particular immigrant that mm -hmm. I wanted to the reason I, I mm -hmm. called you up and said look come on champ let's get you down on on record is really to discuss Himalayan balsam I know obviously there's Japanese knotweed there's rhododendron there's tons of other so-called invasive species but Himalayan balsam it's Himalayan balsam bashing season at the moment mm -hmm. so what is what what's your take on on the usual argument that Himalayan balsam, it comes in, it crowds out our native species, um, it's a thug, it just disrupts our waterways and is unsightly, stinks, um, and we should be doing everything in our power to be basically committing genocide against it. Mm -hmm. Not to be too emotional. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course not. Um, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm familiar uh, with the plant and where it grows, how it grows. It's a very pretty plant generally. I mean, that's why I think it was uh, introduced uh, to this country in the first place. 
so I mean, I, and I've got my own views on the plant and its behavior. Um, but there's a couple of books um, in particular that I've been uh, quite influenced by. They've resonated very strongly with me, what they've had to say about Himalayan balsam. One is Where Do Camels Belong by a British author Ken Thompson and um, The New Wild by Fred Pierce, another British author. Yeah, fantastic books. Um, both wonderful books, um, openly questioning and challenging the standard view on invasive species, both flora and fauna. And both of them quite clearly um, point out that much of the the evidence um, that should be there to support um, the impacts of Himalayan balsam on biodiversity, um, the fact that it's because it's an annual, it dies away at the end of the seed growing season and leaves the soil bare, which is then open to winter rains and the, the higher river volumes of, uh, uh, for, you know, for erosion and things like that, and the riverbanks get eroded, um, the negative effects on pollinators um, and so forth. A lot of the research just doesn't stack up. Yeah. Um, and even if you go on to the cabby.org, which is a center, if I can remember it properly, uh, Center for Agricultural, Agriculture Biosciences International. Basically, it's a kind of uh, national body in this country to, to look into, um, well, a big part of what they do is looking at invasive species and in, in quite an, from an anti point of view. But even on their website, when you look at the, their data sheet on Himalayan balsam, they're quite honest in saying that, that a lot of these, um, uh, uh, I can't think of the word, um, accusations aimed at Himalaya, Himalayan balsam, um, you know, even they say that the science is very, very fuzzy. There's not really any good evidence to support yeah. the biodiversity impacts and so on. Um, and we can we can kind of drill down into that. But, you know, just from my own point of view, the the accusation in terms of of once once the annual plant has died back at the end of the growing season, it's it's kind of leaving the riverbanks um, open to to winter erosion from higher river volumes because it, the plant has smothered out everything else. Um, you know, and there's nothing there stabilizing the bank that that just doesn't feel right to mm -hmm. me. Um, well, and give us, yeah, give us the and and I you know I I could be wrong. I mean I haven't actually uh, got out into the field uh, on my hands and knees and really kind of explored this, but it just doesn't feel right. I mean you take take an, some annual bedding that you've had in pots or containers the following spring, you know after they died back the autumn before. Um, my experience is that those clods of soil are very very firm, yeah. um, uh, and the root the root balls are still very much intact, even though the actual plant has died. And of course, there's plenty of other perennial species that are growing along with balsam, as as Thompson and Pierce po point out. You know, the, the 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 native species that Himalayan balsam is supposed to be out competing or competing with a, yeah. a common ruderal species. So that species that grow in disturbed, in this instance, typically moist habitat, habitats like stinging nettle, bindweed, docks, cleavers and the like, you know, they're, they're quite bold plants in, the, in their own right, but they can, they can kind of cope with that competition to an extent. So it's not as if they've been completely rubbed out of the area, they'll yeah. still be there. And there's evidence to suggest as Ken, Ken Thompson lists, that whilst Himalayan balsam is competing, if you if you kind of accept that um, perception of how plants uh, uh, interrelate with each other, they're competing with common ruderal species, natives, um, but actively suppress other non-natives. So when you remove Himalayan balsam uh, where it's invaded, a lot of other non-natives kind of come in yeah. and and you know it's just hamster wheel time uh, yeah. as it so often is in these in these scenarios so um yeah you know in the angle on um the negative pollinator mm -hmm. um <clears throat> effects it, it, you do get the sense that 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 people who are anti balsam and other invasive species they they're trying to kind of well let's say who they are they're the conservationists they're the old guard archaic dinosaur conservationists who unfortunately control the whole of this bloody country 
and all the regulations. Now, I know you're far more gentle than I am now, but, yeah. you know, it's time to call them on it because they haven't got the science. Whereas if you look at Pierce and the other chap, they have the science. It's listed there. And mm -hmm. I'd just like to point out that Fred Pierce was massively, he is a, an ecologist and a scientist, and he was massively anti-invasives until the data started questioning his model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now he has come out with this new book, The New World, on the side of invasives. So for those conservationists who are twitching and wetting their knickers at this point, I really do strongly suggest that you go and check out his book and check out the science and stop giving immigrants, as we do with human immigrants, a bad rap just because they are other and you personally don't understand them. Yeah, no, I, I would, I'd, I'd commend everyone to read The New Wild. It's, um, it's a wonderful book and, and there is plenty of evidence that the, the science in favour of the anti-position doesn't hold water yeah. uh, very much, if at all, and there's evidence to suggest the opposite. In, in terms of the, the negative pollinator effect with Himalayan balsam, there is evidence to suggest the opposite, that there is what they call an adjacent benefit, yeah. so that other native uh, riparian riverside species um, that are flowering at the same time receive more visits rather than less when they're kind of in the same area as Himalayan balsam, Himalayan balsam being super popular with honeybees and other pollinator insects, which is a, a common trait of, of many, well, invasive plants generally. They, they tend to be, um, have very broad bandwidth appeal to pollinators, which if it's not really a surprise when you consider the kind of circumstances they tend to be arriving in where there's vegetation has been, to varying extents, been removed from an area. So the local pollinators and other insects have a lot less to forage from. Sure. So in and who's been doing that removing? Quite often, good old human Humans. beings, of course. Um, and as Thompson says, you know, so often we, we kill the messenger. Yeah. You know, we get the plants and or animals, in, whether you call them invasive or not, or pioneer opportunist species, um, that kind of come in and, and thrive or perhaps are a response to disturbance. You know, you get the plants and animals that you we deserve in the same way as you get the governments. <laughs> we, de <laughs> we get the governments we deserve. Yeah. God bless them. Um, and yeah, so there, there's, there seems to be a, a, a lot of evidence to support this alternative, much more kind of positive outlook on invasives. I mean, it's it's quite a broad topic. I mean, one of the um, the way I am now starting to look at invasive plants is to try and get a kind of a much bigger picture. And I'll bring this back to Himalayan balsam in a second. Um, bit bigger picture view of what they might be doing, what their ecological role might be. And I've been very influenced by an American author called Stephen Buhner, who's written a lot about plant in intelligence generally and, and invasive uh, plants, um, particularly Japanese knotweed, which he works with over in America as a, as a herbalist, amongst other things. But he makes the point that every living being, every living thing has uh, that's expressed into to physical form has an ecological function. Yeah. The challenge to anyone who, who, who wants to have a, a kind of say in the matter is to find out what that function is and there's a an American another American author and permaculturalist <clears throat> called Tower Ryan who's written another wonderful book called Beyond the War on Invasive Species and she says takes that further it's like yeah you need to find out what that plant is doing what it will have a role yeah. in the ecosystem in the yeah. habitat what is it take the time and even if you come round to the fact that you still don't want it you know yeah. you you want to kind of stand behind cosmic will expressed through you versus <laughs> cosmic will expressed through the kind of the larger <laughs> kind of system yeah. and you still want to go head to head with that then try to do it in a way that's kind of following the grain of nature rather than kind of butting against it with with chemicals etc um, so back to balsam and I, i'm kind of skipping around a little bit but there's a project in um, in germany a place called wiesbaden which, uh, and as many people will know, 
many of, uh, of, of the parts of Himalayan balsam are edible. The young shoots, the seed pods, the flowers. Um, possibly, yeah, okay. Well, we, we, as, as I understand it. Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a whole other... No, no, but 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 there is this discussion. there is this sense that they're that you know there's there they have edible edible. Um, they definitely have edible seeds from my studies. Yeah. Okay. So so irrespective, yeah. there, there's edible parts of the plants, yeah. but there's this project that are making food products. Peter Becker. Yeah. From um, from the plant in order to finance the eradication of the yeah. plant, which is kind of kind of amusing, really. But. Um, and interestingly, you know, the Himalayan balsam, uh, and I was kind of surprised uh, to find this out, but it's one, it's a bark flower remedy, but also one of the five ingredients of the bark's rescue remedy. Right. And its key, key um, uh, word associated with it is impatience. Yeah. Um, which, you know, you, you, can, you can feel the impatience of, of a lot of people and conservationists particularly with the plant so you kind of wonder what might be going on at a deeper level but just going back to how I look at invasives now and, and looking at the ecological function and the way I kind of take it a little bit further and, and kind of imagine if you like that the planet Mother Earth Gaia whatever however you want to describe it has the equivalent of green skin so in the same way that um, when we graze, cut, or otherwise damage our skin, there is an immune response sure. that is engaged to heal that. And the more I consider it, it seems quite plausible that invasive plants are that immune response of that kind of macro green skin vegetal system that are, that are drawn in to an area, depending on the degree of disturbance, um, the more powerful kind of invasive plants tend to correspond with the, the more the greater waste that an area has been been you know uh well, i think uh, pierce mentions suffered. that doesn't he he mentions about how that they they tend to hang out where humans have basically messed up their mm. local ecosystem and land base yeah and so the whole concept of balsam bashing and pointing the finger at the at the invasive you know forgetting that there's three fingers pointing back at mm. ourselves and it's not really dealing with the causative factor. And for me, I, I mean, that thing where Boona says, you know, everything has an ecological function. I'm, you know, for years I've taught that plants have, you know, if, we, if we're patient enough and get out of our own human arrogance, thinking we know it all, hmm. and actually observe, like the ancient Taoists did, you know, 3,000 3, years ago in China, you know, there, there are, nature tells us something. And nature is always giving us guidance. That's hmm. why she is seen as a teacher. Um, and that, the invaders, so-called, are, like you say, like Pierce says, like loads of other people are beginning to, to come to a realisation that, you know, the humans, we've got to be looking at our habitat loss, we've got to be looking at our industrial agricultural practices, and, you know, if you don't want the, the, the Himalayan balsam here or the Japanese knotweed here, ask yourself, what is the human doing that is causing this, like you say, this, um, this healing? Mm to take place because finally in the last two years there's all these books with the science referenced in the back of them pointing to the fact that actually the human is the cause of this and we are the problem they're not the problem they're trying to fix the problem but what one of the reasons i really um was was inspired and, and loved your talk last year was because uh, i've always had this thing of like this, these invasives, whether it's a plant or it's something like monkey deer, they're second guessing climate change. And one of the things that you brought out last year was that a lot of these so-called invasive species come from climates that the climate of the British Isles is expected to be similar within the next 20 years. Is that correct? In certain instances, yes. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, I mean, some of the invasive species that are actively naturalizing in the landscape now, holm oak, for example, the evergreen oak, um, they're, they're kind of perhaps placing our, our wooded landscape in a, in a kind of more resilient, put, putting it at a more resilient stance. Um, and, but I, I think with Himalayan balsam, there's, I haven't noted with that one, uh, I, I think it's the case that the, the, 
and I can't remember the, 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 the timings of introduction off the top of my head, but I think it's probably the case that the, the, the climate here was already quite conducive. And it was... It was the 1830s, I think, it came in. Yeah. It was brought over. Um, and what you'd have to kind of look at then is when, is it rec when was it first recorded in the wild? And amazingly, they have this information for many of these plants. And there are these standard lag periods between introduction and a plant, if it's going to kind of become naturalized or even so-called invasive, there are these lag periods. It's 170 years for trees, about 130 years for shrubs and decades or less with herbaceous plants or, or annuals like Himalayan balsam. So what you'd need to look at is like, OK, when was it introduced and when was it first recorded wild? If it was just a period of decades, then it, it could be that the climate was already conducive. Yeah. If like uh, bay laurel, for example, which was introduced perhaps by the Romans, um, and then you add on, let's say, 130, 150 years, and then, OK, when was it first recorded wild? 1924. Oh, right. Wow. Way beyond wow. the lag period. Yeah. Now, to my mind, my inexperienced non-scientific mind, maybe that's a good thing, um, that strongly suggests that climate change is at play. The climate is sufficiently warm and, and compatible with what bay laurel is used to, particularly in terms of seed regeneration, that it's like, oh, no, this is, this is OK for me now. I'm liking this because of the, the warming that's come since the Industrial Revolution, because of that huge period between introduction um, and, and running wild. Now, so I, I, off the top of my head, I can't remember the, the kind of details for Himalayan balsam, but what we do know, uh, and this is kind of cutting back to what its ecological function might be, is that it's one of these plants like ivy and like cherry laurel. Ivy is regarded as a native, which that language is becoming increasingly uncomfortable for me, you know, yeah. kind of meaningless. Yeah. Um, and cherry laurel is an introduced and regarded as an invasive. But they all, Himalayan balsam as well, are known to thrive on high levels of CO2. I'm guessing we're likely to see more of those kinds of plant or, yeah. or those kinds of plants proliferating, becoming more successful because there's more CO2 in the air. Now, from a holistic macro system point of view, is that response kind of inevitable? Is it a part of the rebalancing uh, process um, that would need to be underway? The guy will try and kind of redress the imbalance that we've we've wrought. Um, but what else might Himalayan balsam be doing? We know it thrives on high nutrient load seems to have a very high mineral content, mm -hmm. which suggests it could be one of, the, one of these plants. And this is where more research needs to be done, kind of with a neutral mindset at least, rather than looking for, pro you know, a, a kind of set up to look for problems, sure. particularly if you're funded by a body that wants to kind of prove that perhaps. But could it be that Himalayan balsam is the kind of plant that acts as a a moderator, a kind of a, a, a plant sink, if you like, yeah. for um, surplus carbon in the atmosphere or surplus minerals, perhaps nitrogen in the soil. And of course, you find you're, where you see it is, is in river systems alongside rivers. And more often than not, there's going to be, in, you know, relatively intensive agriculture, perhaps with, you know, surplus nitrogen runoff. Yeah. Is it playing some kind of role in that whole game? Yeah. Now, from a from a holistic point of view, you'd think, OK, well, that's let's assume it is. We need those minerals, that surplus of whatever it is to kind of either be locked down as carbon or, or, or as minerals to be put back on the land and maybe upstream again. If if the if the the system's purpose is to hold the kind of vitality of the soil. So how might that work? And this is all pure speculation, sure, and might be, and might yeah, be, but questions and, that need answer, and might be asking, co complete baloney. But yeah. we can be honest about that. Yeah. But given that uh, livestock tend to love eating Himalayan balsam, yeah. that represents a possible return path yeah. for those minerals, yeah. because they're going to take it back on, you know, further up field, perhaps further up the valley, and drop it back on the fields or whatever. I don't know, but it, it, it's an interesting thing. And, and is anyone looking at that? I don't know. No, yeah. um, 
So if anyone's listening to this who is looking at exactly that, because I think, I mean, Pete is completely up front. You know, this is purely speculation. But it's, you know, I'm, I, I say on my courses, I don't do woo-woo. Um, but I have to say, at this point, they're questions that I think are fascinating, that there possibly is some semblance of um, a clearer perception of how invasives are functioning within our ecosystems that currently we're not entertaining. So I really, you know, I like the idea that um, I spoke to a chap who used to cull monk jack and deer in general for the lords and ladies in Scotland. And I asked him, I said, you know, monk jack is an invasive species. And, and what are you, what's your take? You're someone very close to the land. You, you're embedded with the landscape. You, you're observing and paying attention to the shifts and moves of um, this progression and impact that climate change is having. What, what do you say? And, and he, he, he came and said, second guessing climate change. I mean, it was just like straight off his head. And I do think that when you were talking that, and I've heard it from two other people, so this is three people completely unconnected, all coming to a similar, um, what's the word? Yeah, yeah, a similar consensus um, about how the ecosystem is shifting. And, you know, the, the old, old guard conservationists are fortress conservationists. You know, humans should be removed from the landscape, blah, blah, blah. We see this all over the world and it's causing chaos. What, you know, the, what the balsam bashing community don't seem to be getting is that, you know, we are moving and we, climate change is... is happening whether you like it or not the evidence is absolutely there and people close to the land especially plant people see it happening in plant development through the years and it's a question of when are you going to wake up and realize that the earth gaia is trying to tell the dumbass humans something and we need to be paying attention and finding the science or not even finding the science, observing it and having people who are far more bright than I am, um, scientists to, anyway, I've completely blown that one. <laughs> Let it happen out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what's the next bit to take it forward? You got something you want to say? <clears throat> it depends if you, if you can edit that out and, r and round that point off with an yeah. edit unless you start again with it mm -hmm. what point was i making <laughs> i was on a rant but yeah I, I, picking up on um what you were saying earlier um i often kind of describe i mean whilst i've studied horticulture and ecology formally i i've kind of most of of what i've learned of value has been from plants themselves just as like as you do and uh, other people we know kind of just getting out and direct experience experiential um, activity with with the plants and, and in in within in context contact is such a one of the most important things I've ever learned and and part of context is that it's always changing yeah you know and back to to the ideas that are still prevalent within the, the conservation uh, fields of, of, you know, we must, it, it's kind of, there's the equivalent with the political landscape at the moment, wanting to make America or Britain great again, getting back to, you know, the good old days. And yeah. it's, you know, you can sympathize with that to an extent because of so many things that are happening in the world. But of course, you've got to keep moving forward. I mean, climate change, no matter what, how effective, you know, we might be at reducing our carbon output in the next five, 10, 15 years or whatever, there's an awful lot of carbon coming through the system yet. So we're, we're kind of locked into a degree of, of climate change. And, you know, we, slowly more and more people are starting to kind of realize that they are, they're having to, we're going to have to embrace at least some of the, of the introduced plants that are actively naturalizing some say invasively so in this country because we and fred pierce points this out very effectively we might be 
really, really glad of those plants, particularly yeah. if, if, if we get accelerated climate change to the extent that some of our key anchor native species literally can't keep up. Yeah. We have, you know, long, for years now, I've been saying, you know, we're a nation of gardeners, great. Um, I mean, maybe that in itself is a, the fact we, we've got one of the most smallest native floras in the world and yet one of the largest cultivated floras in the world with the Edwardians and Victorians and Georgians bringing in plants from all over the world, from our empire. Mm. Um, and we, we've grown them in our gardens. Many have leapt the fence, although Williamson's Law, which you may know about, and some of your listeners may know about, uh, it's um, for every 100 plants that are introduced, 10% um, go on to naturalize in our landscape. 10% of those become invasive. You're talking about 1% that become invasive. And if you listen to someone like Ken Thompson, he'll say there's evidence suggesting that even with those species between a period of 50 to 200 years, which bear in mind is beyond the typical human time frame, which yeah. is why we're missing it. Yeah, exactly. Um, even those species blend into the background. Yeah. I mean, it's native range, Himalayan balsam is not invasive. Japanese knotweed is a pioneer on lava. It's one of the first plants, if not the first plant, that can get on to volcanic lava and start the process of turning it into soil and hastening the arrival of forest. Yeah. So the way I, rather than the old kind of way of looking at ecological succession as the kind of the initial pioneer plants coming in and then progressively they're out competed by wave after wave of you know, more suited, fit plants until you've got forest or woodland back in that location. The pioneer plants like knotweed and Himalayan balsam are kind of preparing the way for those aspects of themselves as one macro vegetal system that can come, arrive and, and, and fully manifest all that vegetation can be in that location. And that's not to kind of discount humans. We know humans are, are having, um, you know, they're, they're, they're a very much a part of nature and we can work with nature rather than against it. Mm. But we have to be uh, cognizant of, of those larger processes that are happening. And, you know, pristine wilderness, that, you know, yeah. it, along with many of these terms like native and invasive, they're becoming kind of mythical yeah. uh, and myths that perhaps we, you know, aren't serving us yeah. anymore. Well, we were talking just earlier, weren't we, about rewilding, the word rewilding, mm. and that I've always felt quite uncomfortable with it. I mean, I understand that people who, who talk about where, where they're coming from, but rewilding is almost this romantic vision of going backwards to this time of pristine environments, of what is, of how it should be, you know, human says, well, the term future wilding would be far more appropriate for me mm. because that is taking in all these models that we've been discussing. Yeah, you're making me feel good about the use of future flora for my uh, for my Facebook page now. <laughs> Ble bless you. But um, no, I mean, I was quite excited by this idea of rewilding. I mean, on so many levels, it feels like a really, really good idea. But I, I happened to drop uh, an organisation who's the, that are involved with this, a new organisation, I believe. They'll remain nameless for the sake of this interview yeah, sure. um, to be nice about it. But um, I was, yeah, quite quite shocked, actually, by the response I had. I was I kind of sent them a, a wee note saying, you know, just out of interest, what, what's your position, re so-called invasive species? And, 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 you know, are you accounting for the use of some of these naturalised and perhaps in certain instances invasive species within your kind of... Uh, rewilding program, particularly with a you know a future proofing um, perspective with climate change and all the rest of it, sure. and they kind of yeah knocked that one back to me. Dude, that was really surprising. It, 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 actually. You know, they said you know we're a conservation organisation, <laughs> and no, and, you're not. and 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 they really really are by the sound of it. Well, and, <laughs> uh, you know, no, but but in in the sense of they're conserving what there is, and and you know, wilderness is we we want to yeah. put yeah, and it's like. You don't need to consider that for very long to see the flaws, yeah. I mean, to my mind, yeah. you know, let alone what my heart feels about it. But it's just it doesn't make sense, you know, and we've got a host now of of 
introduced species that are out and about in the landscape. And I was just reading, actually, there's a new report out by the RHS, the Royal Horticultural Society, looking at the implications of climate change on horticulture, gardening and gardeners. And it's, it's a very interesting read, a lot of the science on climates in there. And they're quite even handed. I mean, there's a lot of standard jargon and narrative around invasives being bad and negative and, you know, invasive species flora and fauna are held to be one of the one of the key threats with climate change. Um, as is becoming obvious in this interview, neither of us necessarily buy into that narrative. No. Um, but they were saying they were talking about holm oak, for example, Quercus ilex, which we mentioned a bit earlier. Um, and they were they were actually acknowledging that that actually could be a beneficial species in terms of you know our our flora in this in in this country. You know as a as a new, I mean if you look look at the 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 bigger picture, it's just a different form of oak. Yeah. Ultimately, I mean we call things. This is that a species of oak. This is another species of oak. Yeah. This is a species of thistle. This is another species of thistle. Whatever it may be. If you zoom out, it's just one continuous flow of DNA. So the holm oak. Uh, even the turkey oak as well, which is a deciduous oak, but from more southerly regions that is also actively naturalizing in this country. Um, you know, those more, they're more suitable, resilient forms of oak for the, for the climate that is coming to our landscape soon. Yeah. Um, in relative, in, you know, geological time frame. But, um, and it just seems sensible to kind of go with that. And interestingly, there was an article in uh, a little kind of, freebie type uh, newspaper put out by Common Ground and the Woodland Trust recently and there was an article in there from two I think it was two ecologists and an environmental campaigner speaking up for um, the likes of sycamore and holm oak turkey oak horse chestnut and trees like that and saying you know we should we should accommodate these species more in our in our planting uh, in our yeah in our tree planting ac across the landscape we, we you know we need to give them a chance because they're going to serve us well. Yeah. Um, so slowly people are starting to think ahead and the Forestry Commission have been talking about this for some time as well. I mean, it's official policy that, you know, people who are planting woodlands or whatever, they need to plant for, between, you know, provenance of uh, particular species between two and five degrees south. Two degrees is Brittany, five degrees is kind of Bordeaux, the Pyrenees kind of area. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's that's growing seed from a, a native species let's say but seed that's come from a, a yeah. field maple or or an oak or whatever from the south of france because it will be that little bit more suited to the warmer temperatures that are coming our way and again that makes sense but even the forestry commission are kind of have been making comments in the direction of we need to be a little bit more creative and imaginative and uh use a larger palette mm. of of tree species in our woodlands in this country and you know, that's just woodlands, mm. you know. So there's many angles we could take that conversation, uh, I know. But. It is. I mean, it, the, the whole invasive species discussion slash debate is obviously going to be hotting up as climate change develops. Definitely a pun intended there. Mm. Um, and we just have to watch this space and see what, what science is coming out and just hope that conservation organisations actually start putting the evidence on the table because at the moment my feelings about many of them is that it's a bit like the old witch um witch trials the inquisition mm. we're going to burn someone on a feeling mm. yeah well where's the evidence they're a witch no mm. no no i i just know they are mm. Mm. you know and i think it's time that we really get the the evidence out and down um however that mm. can happen because we all know that Scientific research has vested interests that pay for it to push certain agendas, but there are these um, kind of outsiders and iconoclasts who are putting their, mm. their neck on the line. Like Fred Pierce, complete about turn, which, mm. no, fair play to the man. That's pretty ballsy when you've got a reputation mm. that potentially is going to be wrecked by doing so. Mm. But I'd like to finish off with a chat a piece not a chat a piece by richard maybe that i dragged off one of the bbc sites 
earlier today and I'm trying to see if I can actually find it if it is even on here and let's see have I got it yes here we go so this is what Richard maybe had to say about Himalayan or as he calls it Indian balsam back in 2011 he says I'd like to raise a, a personal cautionary note about the balsam bashing groups activities we very often forget that Indian balsam grows best on bare soil where other plants aren't growing at all. I've been watching the plant for most of my life, certainly the best part of 40 years, and I can't say I have ever seen an instance where it has displaced native vegetation. And I wish, because it would greatly strengthen their case, if balsam bashers had some hard science about what happens to a patch of native riverside vegetation when Himalayan balsam moves in. As for the future, I think we have to accept that Himalayan balsam is here to stay. The more that machinery churns up the area around ditches, the more that muddy corners of fields are disturbed, the more we dump the dredgings from rivers onto riverside banks, the more we actually create the open muddy situations that the fruits of Himalayan balsam just adore. And maybe, we should also remember that cautionary note from poet Anne Stevenson. Plant extinctions are happening all over the globe as a result of climate change, pollution, habitat loss. I think we really need to think seriously before we choose to eliminate newcomers to the ecosystems of any country, however aggressive and invasive they might be. In 50 years time, they might be just what we need. So thank you, Pete, for the discussion. You're very welcome, Robin. Um, all reference to your site and your work and the books we mentioned will be in the show notes on the web page. Brilliant. Can I make one final point? Absolutely. Yeah, it's just that, I mean, I, I fully, fully concur with what, what Richard was saying there. And um, in, in my experience, uh, speaking with ordinary people when I do my, my walks and talks and, and, and presentations, um, when they hear what I have to say, this this you know information around a, a completely alternative narrative on on immigrant invasive whatever descriptor you want to use plants, um, the overwhelming response is a kind of like, yeah, no, actually that kind of makes sense, and that's that's really interesting, and and it, at the very least, why I do what I do is to kind of just balance up the debate yeah. because it's been Im imbalanced for so long. Sure. And the imbalanced side, the more I look at it, just does not stack up. It doesn't make sense. And so I feel we need to kind of just openly, honestly look at this other side. And like you say, it may be that there is good hard evidence for, for some of these species, perhaps. Again, that may be only a short term effect. Yeah. Um, but let's have an open, full debate on this. Um, and, and I think we, we'll all be the richer for that. Thank you very much.